Mort, not old. Hi, I'm Mort Cooper, your host on Change Your Voice, Change Your Life in the studio. With me is my co-host, Dr. John Curtis, and we today came up with the title. Uh, John usually has the title, and what is the title today? It's the bottom line, uh, you know, at the National Institutes of Health. The bottom line at the National Institute of Health. Yeah, National Institutes. Yeah, yeah. National Institute of Health. What does that mean, bottom line, at the National Institute of Health? Well, it could be that, a lot. No, that organization gets $28 billion approximately, give or take $100 million or two, uh, for their uh, a scientific inquiry that is telling us what is real in life and what is scientific and what is not. Yeah. Um, well, bottom line is, uh, you know, you could, it could be Elias Zuhin, uh, Zahuni's bottom line. You can't even say that fellow's name. Well, Zahuni. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who is uh, Zahuni? He's not a terrorist, and he doesn't work for al-Qaeda. Who the, is Zahuni? He, he's Zahuni is the head of the National Institutes of Health. Uh -huh. And according to Zuhini, Zahini, or Zahuni, uh -huh. he can't keep top scientists without allowing them to have independent uh, uh, relationships with publicly traded drug companies earning separate salaries through them mm -hmm. and stock options w wait a minute you're and consulting arrangements you're going too fast for me can you break it down so it's a mcdonald kind of thing you know where i can get it i'm, I'm a little slow and simple i, I really am well I, look at the, the, the we're talking about the bottom line at the national institute's health he, they claim they can't get good scientists unless they let them double dip look, by doing the research double the, wait a minute wait get a, a, a salary a who, who, salary. Is, who is arguing about what david wilman wrote something in the L.A. Times. Well, David Wilman article. is an investigative reporter for the Los Angeles and Times. And what did he investigate? Well, he exposed something that he uncovered, which was that many of the researchers, the scientists at the National Institutes of Health, received their government salaries, but they also had second... And maybe 150, 200,000... Somewhere in that ballpark. Okay, yeah. not bad. For, for the average person, <laughs> I think they'd be uh, quite content with just their, the, the government <laughs> salaries they're getting. And then, on the other hand, that wasn't enough. So uh, many of these scientists have uh, lucrative consulting agreements with many of the publicly traded drug companies. Mm -hmm. And they have something else that was very interesting. Well, sometimes they get stock options. Sometimes. And, and the stock options are not recorded as an expense to the publicly traded yeah, companies. The stock options can be where the real money is, not the salaries from the government or the salary from the uh, they could be worth into the millions. Why? That's the issue that we're getting to. Why is it the bottom line at the NIH that we're discussing? What is the stock option worth to the scientists? Are there, I think, 93 uh, directors of various divisions, if I'm correct, um, and they can get stock options. Oh, yeah. They can get stock options. Now, why, why is this an issue that comes to the fore. Well, because they, they think that it, it can compromise objectivity in, in, for scientists who are there supposedly uh, finding yay or nay, does the drug or the, the service product that they're studying, does it ha is it safe and is it effective? Mm -hmm. It's very easy for somebody who's getting paid as an outside consultant to say, well, I'm not going to report the negative findings on my research. I'll only report the positive findings on it because it will impact my stipend or my stock options or my consulting Which uh, can agreement. be millions. Could be into the millions. Yeah. So that's the concern that stock options and double dipping It's a can com compromise. compromising the objectivity of scientists. And what is science all about? Well, the, the, what, what is science well, all about? Science is about a methodology. It's, 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 a, it's an attempt through a methodology to test hypotheses. To be independent. Independent and objective. And truthful. Yeah. Now, the drug companies, folks, have the right, I understand, and I'm open to uh, correction if this is wrong, but I read about it in, in newspapers such as the New York Times and the L.A. Times and other uh, well-known newspapers. I presume it's correct. The drug companies have the right to vet or to remove information, even though they sponsored the study, uh, that doesn't agree with their concerned outcome. So even if the, the scientists are objective and saying, we have doubts about this outcome and this study, what we're doing, um, the drug company can override the research, the scientists, scientific research, even when the individual working for the company is seeking to be independent, even though he's double-dipping and he has stock options. So even if he does that, 
What are his chances of getting another job with that company if he says, nay, I don't agree with uh, what the drug company is about? What, what, is, what are his chances? I, I think it's a uh, uh, very Just good, ch good uh, chance that he's not going to be, uh, his consulting contract mm -hmm. will be canceled. Now, in a recent newspaper report in the New York Review of Books by Richard Horton, the editor of Lancet, it's a very prestigious British journal. It's British worldwide. Medical Journal. Very well known. By the way, they were uh, Lancet came out with the uh, piece that indicated that Resolin, which was a drug to treat diabetes, was toxic, created a terrible a liver toxicity. It was actually taken off the market in Great Britain. They published that two years before, before it was published mm -hmm. in any journal in the United States, two mm -hmm. years in advance. So this is a very forward-thinking and uh, mm -hmm. independent medical journal. Um, Horton is of the view that um, science and medicine can be compromised by uh, what's going on in research in the scientific community. Uh, and he is uh, concerned that this uh, can uh, have consequences from uh, possible compromises that well, are going on. Dr. Zuh Zuhuni said that the... Zahuni is where? He's, he's at the National Institutes of Health. That's what our show is about and today. And what is his position? He, he said that his, his researchers have the highest degree of integrity. I have no doubt about that. What is his position? His position is that they can't get top researchers at the National Institutes of Health unless they let them double dip. Mm -hmm. uh, now, an interesting... I think that's an interesting take on the situation because what it really means is that he can't institute a policy. He thinks that instituting a policy that says conflicts of interest, mm. like working for drug companies and conducting research, mm. cannot be prohibited mm. because we'll lose all our scientists. Mm. Because they'll go work in the private sector. I mean, that's his argument. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Congress has got a real dilemma on this right now, and there are people looking into this that mm. are uh, utterly baffled because uh, we know that there are drugs that are being approved right now that are neither safe nor effective, mm. uh, that are making their way onto the shelves and uh, people are being uh, injured by them. Or at, at the very least, you talk about side effects. Mm. What about just efficacy? I mean, mm. if you're charging money for a drug, do you think that, uh, apart from the fact that it may have side effects, don't you think that you have a right to know that it's effective and what it does? I mean, look at Botox, for instance. The manufacturer claims it's 99% effective for in treating, course, treating uh, spasmodic uh, dysphonia, the strangled voice. What is that? Can you imitate it? Uh, this is why you're talking. Well, I'm going to imitate a phone call that I had mm -hmm. with a lady in, in the Chicago area. I had the same. I had a her, conversation with her. Her name was Dot Sowerby. Yeah. And, she's and this is what she talked. Uh, Dr. Curtis, uh, Dr. Cooper's too expensive. Uh, I can't afford his treatment. Can you understand her? Well, I understood. She said that you were too expensive because I told her to go to Dr. Cooper instead of getting these Botox shots. I, I offered a free treatment. <laughs> and you know what's interesting about Sowerby? Dot Sowerby. Uh, is, Who is affiliated she? with the, the, the National Spasmodic Dysphonic She's Association. She's not affiliated. She's the president of the National Spasmodic well, she, Dysphonic she, Association. She doesn't work at the... She, she, she's of the non-profit wing of that or whatever, you know, their board. Maybe the president of the board. She's the president of the spasmo National Spasmodic... She has written a, a book, Living okay. with Spasmodic Dysphonia. Well, what I find interesting... And she's been on Botox for years. Look, McAllister is the executive director. He, he's, yeah, but she's the she president. She defers everything to McAllister. Yes, that's fine. But she is the president. And McAllister... And I want to go back to something. Okay. She's on Botox. Yes, she is. And I told her, I said, you know, you've tried the Botox treatment. She's been on Botox That's for years. That's the way she talks. And <laughs> I said, why don't you try a treatment? Dr. Cooper has been uh, curing patients of spasmodic dysphonia for the last 35 years. Don't you think you should go and try that? I said, obviously, you know, your, spas you know, your Botox treatments are not working. Mm. And that's what she says to talk to Dr. Mc, uh, to McAllister. So I talked to McAllister. He says, uh, and I, you know, I have a journalist calling. I'm doing, a, uh, you know, some research uh, on a spasmodic dysphonia. Um, we don't endorse any medical treatments of any kind. Mm. We are completely politically neutral mm. with respect to treatments in the area of spasmodic dysphonia. That's what McAllister said. Then I read, read an interesting article. There are 501. There are 501 organization that gets generous donations of money from Allegan, the maker of Botox. Yeah. Uh, but I, then, then after talking with McAllister, mm -hmm. I, I read an article from USA Today mm -hmm. in which he was quoted. Mm -hmm. He was quoted as saying two things. Botox is a godsend, mm -hmm. and it is the cat's meow. No, now, he, said, he said first it's a cat's meow, and then he says it's a godsend. Okay. 
let's get let's get his non let's get his object approach okay. to the treatment. Will you tell me how does that does that sound like somebody who is being neutral about a specific treatment by referring to it as the cat's meow and a godsend? Yeah, obviously yes. Could there be any other conclusion? <laughs> Could you be any other conclusion, folks? I See, that, is, that is what I would call total objectivity. Yeah, uh, total neutrality. But look, if people see things, Robert Burns said, we're God to give us the gift to see ourselves as others see us. Perhaps if we could give McAllister back the statement as we heard it to him, he may have thought other than what he said. I'm, I, I'm trying to give a, an out for McAllister, who's a very decent okay. gentleman, and he's defending his turf. He's, he's an executive director of a company. He's getting paid from that company, uh, that outfit. It's a 501c nonprofit. That's right. Uh, he has a nice position with him. He's a, a very decent guy. I've spoken with him and written. But the point is that they don't want cures. There. Okay. Here, here's, here's something. I offer cures, I want you to they don't want this. cures. Explain this paradox to the audience, because I think it is a paradox. We talked with this president of the National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association. She is currently and has in the past received Botox treatments. Mm -hmm. Ongoing. She has one of the worst cases of spasmodic dysphonia, unremitting cases mm -hmm. imaginable. <laughs> she, that's the way she talks. No, no, no. You understood more than I did. I'm only a voice doctor. <laughs> And I, I uh, uh, and I said, Dot, I don't understand you. Can you repeat that? And I was not putting her down. I re simply could not understand what she just wanted to and, clarify. Uh, 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 Dot, okay. Look, why is she the president of an organization that presumably disseminates the state-of-the-art information on spasmodic dysphonia, and yet she is the poster child of the abysmal? And I mean abysmal, a bottomless pit of failure of Botox treatments in the area of treating spasmodic dysphonia. This is an off-label drug. And incidentally, Pfizer just recently has paid out over 400, I believe, in $30 million mm -hmm. in a settlement in the case of Neurotin using a, neuro, uh, a actually an anticonvulsive drug for a variety of other kinds of treatments mm. that they use it for, including depression and so They use as an off-label drug. Right. And, and Botox is an off. No, Botox is, is an off label. label also. Do you want to voice. explain what Botox it, it means when it's off label? Well, go ahead. But I, Botox, it's not directly approved by the Federal Drug Administration, so it's used for eye spasms, blepharospasms, like that, and neck spasms, um, torticollis, and so the medical community can use it for any purpose they see fit once it's approved directly by the FDA. Uh, and it's called an orphan or off-label uh, drug. Um, Pfizer was sued and paid out a settlement of $430 million. Uh, you seem to think that's a large amount. What were they, what were they censured for? Well, they're censured basically for um, taking a drug that was approved for one function mm -hmm. and then utilizing it for another and then, of course, causing uh, adverse side effects and, mm -hmm. and uh, ineffectual treatment. Okay. Botox is creating serious side effects uh, for spasmodic dysphonia. I see that in the office. I get email. Uh, it does not appear from my reading of the literature to appear there. And uh, the, uh, uh, the organization that um, McAllister belongs to, um, the NSDA, does not uh, report these serious side effects that I know of. But uh, that I'm reporting. Actually, they, they say the side effects are short-lived because right. Botox wears I, I off. I know what they're saying, right. Well, is that yeah. true? Not from my experience. That they no. just wear off and the patient never has any further side effects? Well, if, if you don't get the literature to tell you what's going on, you have to get it from a, another source that's clinical activity where I see these patients that are emailing me and calling me and telling me their serious side effects. And I see these people from all walks of life there, uh, the top executives and uh, top companies, uh, their medics, their their uh, lawyers, their doc uh, doctors, uh, uh, PhDs. Uh, I, I'm seeing a wide spectrum. Uh, the question I ask myself is, what I'm seeing 
contained only in a small group or is this worldwide but it's not be re being reported in the literature and I, I hope that I'm wrong in believing that it's it's um, uh, it's uh, a problem uh, worldwide but it's not being reported there are serious uh, reasons for it not being reported but I, I wanted to get uh, to other issues what is your issue you have some issue on the table well, I mean, I, the, I think the, ma the thing we we're talking about in the show today is this, uh, the notion is can you double dip, can, can science be compromised? Mm -hmm. can it be, is, is science basically in medicine for sale? Mm -hmm. I think that's a legitimate question uh, that the role and the influence, the tentacles uh, reaching into public, uh, publicly traded corporations whose really uh, major emphasis is to shareholders for earnings on a quarterly basis. Uh, uh, if they lose their approval of these drugs or they d never don't obtain approval, their, their stocks usually plummet. We saw that happen with the Implone Systems. Mm -hmm. Martha Stewart uh, may go to jail as a result of it. The founder, Sam Waxel, is already in jail. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a legitimate question that people have. Uh, it can the National Institutes of Health, um, with a high degree of confidence, be free from the kind of influence peddling that goes on with uh, in American enterprise? No, I, I, I think that... Uh these compromises are part, an integral part of, of the American um, scene. I think it's it's not just now or so it's new. I think it's been existing, but we don't report it. Um, there's another attribute that's going on. Uh, that's my take on it. Um, Christy Ludlow is uh, in my field, or I'm in her field. Um, she runs the National Institute of Health Voice and Speech section Neurology. Neurology. Yeah. And Christie is of the view that most voice problems are due to neurological problems. I have written extensively saying that's not so. It's due to functional misuse. You're talking wrong and you don't know it, and that's why you're having a, a problem with your voice. But uh, Christie uh, is of the view, and she recently in, in uh, March, I think, 8th, um, in Washington, D.C., 2003, uh, ran a... Uh, um, a uh, presentation sponsored by Allegan, the maker of Botox, and she declined to allow me to present cures, and she told you what when you asked why I wasn't on the program. Well, she says she's known you for many years, and she says you have nothing new to report. Mm -hmm. well, I said, but he's reporting cures mm -hmm. of a condition that you're mm -hmm. reporting is un incurable. I mean, isn't that an astounding accomplishment? The whole field says it's incurable. Isn't, isn't that an amazing accomplishment? And wouldn't you like to disseminate that information, uh, you know, at this meeting? What is the basis for her denial of my presence at this meeting? Um, Allegan well, sponsored she told me. Meeting. She says that Do D Dr. Cooper does not have phase one, phase two, phase three trials. What is that? Well, that's what they subject a drug to when they're with, seeking approval. When it's a medical problem. A medical problem with, uh, or uh, using a ph pharmaceutical product. And what's my answer to Christy Ludlow? Well, you, you always say that, Christy, uh, this is not a medical treatment. It's not a medical problem. It's not a medical problem. I don't do a medical treatment. I'm not required to do uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three. That's right. And I'm reporting cures. I'm the only one in the country in the world reporting ongoing cures of spasmodic dysonia for over 30 years. Now, what's at issue here? The people's uh, involved in the paradigm that strangled voice is a medical problem, a neurological problem, began in 1960 with Roe, Brumlick, and Moore. Um, my position is that it is not a medical position or a medical problem uh, because I cannot cure a medical problem. I cannot talk a patient out of a medical problem. They're calling it a dystonia, which means it's a neurological problem. I'm saying the problem is caused by misuse and wrong use of the voice and that it's curable. And I've been reporting these cures involving UCLA Medical Center, uh, patients diagnosed there. Fifteen cases over a period of almost 30 years have been cured, recovered from um, spasmodic dysphonia. Well, I'm That's only it. one prestigious, well-known medical yeah. center where I used to be a clinical professor. Okay, I'm glad you're bringing medicine. that up because yeah. I, I want to bring to the uh, audience attention mm -hmm. the... Uh, classical piece of research, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have to show it right now, but it's, mm -hmm. it's called the laryngoscope, our study of spastic dysphonia by Roe, Brumlick, and Moore in 1960. Mm -hmm. In the conclusion, the bottom line of the article is that they state categorically and emphatically mm -hmm. that spastic dysphonia has a neurological basis. Mm -hmm. One sentence later, they make this statement, and this is your key mm -hmm. in why uh, 
it's reasonable for people to listen to your, uh, your point of view. It cannot be stated, it cannot be stated that the neurologic and electroencephalographic abnormalities related to voice disturbances uh, as a cause and an effect. What they're saying basically is that their inference from this article on the basis it completely turned your field upside down and changed the paradigm into a neurologic one. From a psychiatric They're one. saying, mm -hmm. the authors have mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. categorically that you cannot infer cause and effect, which is what you've been saying for a long time, that they're treating a symptom, mm -hmm. they're not treating the cause, they're treating an effect, basically, which is that if they get an abnormal brain pattern, if they get an abnormal oscilloscope, whatever the reaction is, extra vibration, extra spasming, mm -hmm. that is an effect, not a cause. The cause is um, muscular, uh, it's a uh, uh, mechanical breakdown, it's due to wear and tear, it's, it's not due to a neurological basis, that's not, the cause is a uh, mechanical breakdown. That's what you've been saying mm -hmm. for the last 40 years. But they and, they, and they are saying in this that we cannot determine in their research, mm -hmm. which was definitive research, Mm. that any inferences uh, of, of, uh, neuro of neurological disturbances, they cannot say that one is a cause and one is the effect. They're saying there's a, a uh, spiking in a, one of the lobes of the brain. But they're not saying whether it's a cause or an effect. That's correct. Now, what is the next statement they made, if you would read that, that they're saying that they are not opposed to psychiatric oh, that, this is an interesting uh, statement mm -hmm. here in the same article. Yeah. The authors do, do, do not mean to imply that there are no psychiatric abnormalities in spastic dysphonia or that psychotherapy does not have its place in treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been curing patients for 35 years. No, 30 plus years. Okay. How, many, how much psychotherapy do you do with your patients? The only psychotherapy is the voice image and voice identity, which I say is the psychological and emotional attribute, because they have a, a, an idea of voice use, which is incorrect, which is setting up the spasmodic dysphonia. All spasmodic dysphonia, all strangled voices in the lower throat, all of it. Gerald Burke at UCLA expresses the medical view, saying it's a dystonia, a focal laryngeal dystonia. I'm saying it can't be a dystonia because I can change it very quickly in the overwhelming number of cases, over 90% of the time, taking it from the lower throat and putting it up in the face where all good and great voices are. So I'm saying their concept is off the board. The paradigm is wrong. Well, they're saying the parad the, their paradigm, the Robe, Brumlick, and Moore, which is what really is mirrored to, in today's literature, is that spas spasmodic dysphonia is a neurological condition. It's an intractable condition, mm -hmm. that it's an incurable condition, that uh, nothing can be done. Now, if that were true, if it is in fact a dystonia, mm -hmm. and the uh, neurological conditions cannot be reversed, and you are not a neurologist, are you? No, okay. not that I know of. Then how is it that you're able to get results from these patients? Because the problem is not a neurological problem. That's the whole point I'm making. I seem to be the only one in the world arguing the issue that uh, this condition, spasmodic dysphonia, is not a neurological problem. It's not a medical problem. It's not a dystonia. It's not essentially a psychiatric problem. You can get psychiatric problems stemming from. The Are you talking like that? And we have it people like Robert Kennedy Jr. You're talking like this. Uh, I listen to him, and if you don't get psychiatric problems out of that, I, I'd be surprised. Diane Weem has it. But I have another take but on it. But psychiatric problems are an effect. That is, they're a symptom of a problem of mechanical breakdown, which is a person's using their voice incorrectly and, and wearing the voice out, essentially. Mm -hmm. They're wearing it out as long as... It, you, you, you've sometimes said, it's, look, it's like wearing the wrong kind of shoe. If the, shoe the is, wrong foot backwards. Okay, but I mean, <laughs> you, you've said that, if, if look, if you wear the wrong type of shoe, the average person will get, get a callus or something, right? Right. It's going to build up on their foot. Right. You get the right kind of shoe, the callus goes away. Right. You don't need surgery. That That's right. You, you don't, don't need, need surgery for that. No. You don't need to have your leg amputated. No. But if you have a strangled voice, and, it's hard like this. and you're convinced by the medical community or colleagues in my field that it's a hopeless and curable condition, and the only answer is Botox, I wish you well. And I say to patients, try Botox, my friend, and see if it works for you. If it works for you, I'm delighted. But I'm getting the, the uh, cases that are saying it doesn't work, or if it does work, they still want out. They're afraid of the long-term downside effects. And I'm not finding the, the, the statistic that I, I've heard medics tell patients it's 99% effective, safe and effective. From the outcome, the Botox voice is not 
uh, effective, and it's not safe from what the patients are telling me. Yeah, I, I think the so it, there, there's a there's a different uh, the view. They have one paradigm. I have another finding. Yeah, the patients who are you know people out there maybe you know you're listening. You have a voice problem of one kind or another. Maybe you have no voice problem. Mm -hmm. You don't have to trust uh, what Dr. Cooper is saying because. Uh, uh, what you need to do is just contact the National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association and ask to talk with Dot, Dot Sowerby. Mm -hmm. Dot's the president of the organization. This is the main advocacy group for spasmodic dysphonia in the country. And she is painfully disabled and afflicted mm -hmm. with spasmodic dysphonia and has received repetitive Botox injections. Mm -hmm. She is a perfect example of how Botox is a failure in the treatment of spasmodic dysphonia. And yet the medical profession, and, and in fact, uh, even when pre pre presented with contrary uh, evidence, in, in other words, a patient being cured. Uh, we, we know this about Norman Hokikian at the University of Michigan. His patient presented back, him, Ingstrom, cured of spasmodic dysphonia. What did he want to do? He wanted to give her another Botox shot because he was going to treat the underlining, as you call it, the substrata. It's really the neurological, the neurological condition. And he's saying, I treated the functional. Well, I, I, I can accept his position because it's a medical position. It's the position held in the field that spasmodic dysphonia is a neurological problem. The psychiatric problem or condition or paradigm was held for 90 years. It still prevails from 1871 when Trow first described spasmodic dysphonia as nervous hoarseness. And it still prevails today, but I don't read anywhere that they have a single cure anywhere since 19, since 1871 of this condition called strangled voice. We have one minute left, Dr. Well, why are cures such a dirty word in the field? I mean, we're talking about the bottom line here. Let's think about what, why is a cure a dirty word? Because it upsets the apple cart, the paradigm, uh, the ongoing treatment That's of it. spasmodic dysphonia, four to ten Botox shots a year, uh, surgical thousand procedures, thousand dollars a shot. and no cure. Chronos chronicity means ongoing for life. So I think the paradigm that they have and the paradigm that I have is worlds apart. They don't have a single cure, and I have ongo Are ongoing. Are you pleased care. when your patients finish your treatment and never have to return back to pay I'm you? I'm delighted. To, to never pay you one extra I, nickel? I am delighted. Gail Pace at UCLA diagnosed with ST, 13 years cured. Reverend James Johnson, the mayor. Does that bother you? They don't, come, they don't have to come back for ongoing I'm delighted. I talk with them. I, I think it's the, it's the cat's meow. It's a godsend. Okay, when they don't come back for treatment, right? Yes, when they don't come and, back and for treatment. And if you sit in your office just typing away and writing or whatever, that's okay with you, right? That's fine with me. Thank you, folks, for joining with me. I'm reporting cures. The bottom line, there is a cure. But Thank see, this is, this is what I don't get. Why is it that the other professions, they have to get the patients coming back? You're content to sit in an empty room. I'm more than doing content. Your I'm delighted. Doing I'm your delighted. Typing. But that's what but medicine they're is They're not content. That is they what, need the person to come back for the That is what the Hippocratic Oath is about. Do no harm in natural healing. But that's not And that's why the physicians right? have gone into the field to help patients. I do not understand why they are taking the position that this condition which is cured, which they know I reported medical meetings,